Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to MIT Bitcoin Expo 2021, The New Normal. <clears throat> I'm Nabil Yunus, and I have the pleasure of being this year's Logistics Director. Uh, with us this morning, we have a keynote from Neha Narula. She's the director of the MIT Media Labs Digital Currency Initiative, where her research focuses on cryptocurrencies and distributed systems. She received her PhD in computer science from MIT in 2015. Uh, and she's published many great uh, papers <clears throat> on Bitcoin security, on uh, you know, uh, di uh, on central bank digital currencies, and and so on. Uh, in her previous life, she used to work uh, as a senior software engineer at Google. Thank you for joining us this morning, Neha. Thanks, Nabil. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for waking up relatively early, uh, especially for those of you joining from the West Coast or outside the US, maybe Asia. Um, uh, like Nabil said, my name is Neha, um, and it's a pleasure to be with you and with the organizers of the MIT Bitcoin Expo, many of which have done research or uh, worked with us at the Digital Currency Initiative. So very much excited to be here. Um, so the title of my talk is Bitcoin 2107, Did We Make It? Now, you might be wondering why 2107? What, is, what, what happens in 2107? Well, don't worry, all will be revealed in good time. Um, so one thing that I want to say really quickly is that I do love Bitcoin very much. I want to make that clear. I uh, spend a, a lot of my time thinking about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and um, some of the underlying things behind it. Uh, however, I might be saying some things in this talk that sound like I'm attacking Bitcoin. Um, what I want to make clear is I think we attack the things that we love. Um, we do that because we want to make them better. So even though it sounds like I might be attacking Bitcoin a little bit in this talk, really what I'm trying to do is talk about some of the things that we can do to make Bitcoin better uh, and to get it to a point where it is thriving in 2107. Uh, because there's kind of still an open question, I think, around decentralized systems and Bitcoin in particular. A lot of people will tell you Bitcoin's done, it's hardened, it's so secure, it can withstand any sort of attack. And I actually think that is still an open question. Um, yes, it has been 12 years and, and so far so good, as we like to say, uh, but past performance, past uh, does not predict future performance. Um, and so I think it's still an open question as Bitcoin gets bigger and bigger, as we enter this new era, um, and as more people start to find it, it, the question remains, can decentralized systems work at scale in the long term? Can we actually have systems that are run by people and not institutions uh, and that can work in a very open and adversarial environment? And what does it mean to work? Well, I think that's uh, two things. First of all, they need to remain open uh, and accessible. They, they need to be open permissionless systems still, and they need to continue to be useful. So you need to be able to use them to make transactions, to, um, to feel some security that you are actually holding your Bitcoin. So I think it's still an open question uh, whether or not these kinds of systems can really work at scale. Uh, I think we have a lot of evidence that, that indicates they might. Um, and I'm really excited to do the work necessary to help to show that. That's a lot of what the work that we do at the DCI is focused on. So let's get started. Uh, Bitcoin, as you probably know, operates in a very challenging environment. So first of all, one of its core principles, there's 24 seven global access for everyone. Anyone can join the network, anyone can look at the code, anyone can propose a change to the code, anyone can start mining, um, and everything is out in the open. There's no hiding in Bitcoin. There's no way to uh, you know, you know, try to block things off or something like that. And uh, there's also no undo, there's no undo button. If you lose your keys, no one is going to go get your Bitcoin for you. There isn't a system administrator or some kind of master holder. What's done is done. And uh, I think that's a core principle of the community. And uh, no one should rely on, you know, if things go really bad, someone's gonna come around and, and help you. Um, it's decentralized open source software. And that is really important to realize. There isn't a leader or manager of the Bitcoin network. There isn't someone who's in charge of what code goes in, what code people work on. 
developers actually work on what they want to work on. Uh, I'm not sure if people really realize that. It's kind of amazing, but it also means that there isn't necessarily a lot of organization or high level roadmaps or things like that when it comes to Bitcoin. Uh, and then this is really important. Attacks are pretty easily monetizable. Now, easily is, is relative. Uh, but the thing to note here is that attackers can attack anonymously and make off with quite a bit of value these days. Market cap of Bitcoin is just keeps climbing higher and higher um, in terms of dollars. And uh, in terms of Bitcoin, it's exactly the same. Uh, and so attacks are, uh, are, are easily monetizable and combined with the whole no undo thing, they're irrevocable. Uh, and combined with the 24 seven global access for everyone, there's no barriers in place to keep someone from executing attack if they figure out how to do one. There are still many open questions uh, remaining in making Bitcoin achieve uh, long-term scalability and security. Uh, one big area is the network incentives and mechanism behind Bitcoin. This is what is known as the mining. And the really big question, the really big open question, I think, is will current mining incentives work in the long term? Will they continue to work? What does that look like? Uh, what are some things we need to be prepared for? And a specific part of that uh, that's, that's, I think, on a lot of people's minds is what happens when we transition from a block reward that is based on inflation, meaning minting new coins in the block to the miners, to one where uh, the block reward switches over to transaction fees. So miners are rewarded by accumulating the transaction fees, which right now are quite a bit smaller than the block reward. Uh, so we don't actually exactly know what's going to happen in the future as the block reward um, continues to decline. Another big area where there are still a lot of open questions is in the area of bugs and vulnerabilities. These systems, again, combining the whole open and can't undo thing means that it is actually pretty challenging to secure these systems. That I think is like 98% of the work that's happening here is figuring out how to secure them. Uh, and so a big question is figuring out where bugs or attacks might surface and how can we put in place measures to detect them and even prevent them? Um, and then another part of that is how can we effectively deploy fixes to things that might not be backwards compatible? So they might not necessarily, we might not necessarily be able to do them as what's known as a soft fork, which is backwards compatible. Fixing some bugs might require hard forks, um, but you know we want to figure out how to effectively do these things when they're pretty much accepted by the community as a whole. Um, and I, I really want to emphasize that uh, we really need community consensus to push through changes. Um, the way that I think Bitcoin should work is that it should be uh, it shouldn't be possible to push through changes that people uh, oppose. Bitcoin should be relatively easy to change if everyone reasonable agrees and almost impossible to change if they don't. That is, I think, a pretty core principle of an effectively decentralized system. Uh, and I also want to emphasize the word effectively in how can we effectively deploy. It's not just code and it's not just writing software and fixing technical challenges, it's also mental energy. Uh, we need to be able to figure out how to do this with while preserving everyone's sanity. Most people don't enjoy arguing all the time and constantly fighting logical fallacies, which it feels like comes up every single time we, we have to deal with something like this. And so um, though many people might think it, it Bitcoin emerged perfectly formed from the mind of Satoshi, I would actually argue Bitcoin is not done. And here is a very specific example that relates to the title of this talk, 2107. So here is the protocol for a block header. Block header is super important. They're the part of a block that commits to the transactions, that has the proof of work, um, that has the um, indicates, uh, you know, commits to things like the block reward and indicates uh, how much proof of work is necessary. So here is the literal data that goes inside a block header. And it this information is very important. It's important everybody agrees on it and knows how to parse it. Now, okay, version, previous block, Merkle root, bits, nonce, transaction count, okay, and timestamp. We, we need to know when blocks are created. But there's this little parenthetical right there next to timestamp that says, will overflow in 2106. Uh, well, that's a little concerning. What does that mean? <laughs> what does it mean that it's gonna overflow? Is this something we need to worry about? 
Well, this all stems from the fact that um, in Bitcoin, we use a, uh, a type of variable called an unsigned integer that is 32 bits wide to represent the timestamp. So 32, okay, what does that mean? Why do we even care about that? Well, <clears throat> the timestamp, the way it's represented is it's literally the number of seconds since January 1st, 1970. And this is how Unix timestamps just work. Um, they are numbers that we use to represent time and we count the number of seconds since 1970. So if we actually represent the bits of a timestamp and there's 30, there should be 32 of those zeros there. If they're all zero, then that represents Thursday, January 1st, 1970. Um, and you know that gets incremented as time moves forward. Uh, now, the problem here is we only have 32 bits, and eventually we are going to fill all of those with ones. That is going to happen. We know exactly when that's going to happen. That is going to happen on Sunday, February 7th, uh, 2106, and uh, at 628 uh, um, in the morning. Uh, and then when the next second ticks, what's going to happen is that this variable is going to overflow. There's no more space for us to represent value in this. We only have two to the 32 values that we can represent. And when it overflows, it's just going to roll back over to zero. So, um, well, actually, it's kind of undefined behavior exactly what happens. Um, in C++, there's this thing called undefined behavior where basically the compiler is allowed to do whatever it wants. So we think it might overflow, but uh, who knows exactly what will happen on various different systems. Different crazy things could happen. Maybe the whole program crashes. And uh, this would happen to every Bitcoin node. Exciting, right? Um, what happens if it rolls over? Why is this worrisome if we just roll over time back to 1970? Well, in the Bitcoin network, there are these rules for what the block timestamp has to look like. So when a new block comes out, in addition to that block, having enough proof of work, the block needs to be valid according to certain rules. There are a lot of rules. The ones concerning the timestamp are as follows. So when a new block comes out, its timestamp needs to be greater than the medium timestamp of the last 11 blocks in the blockchain and less than the median timestamp of all the nodes I'm connected to, roughly their average, plus two hours. So it's got to be kind of in this window. That's, what, that's how timestamps work, and this is pretty important. Now, the problem is when we roll over back to 1970, this is not going to be true anymore. And this means all blocks are going to get rejected, um, maybe for about 100 years. Then we might get another block in, but then uh, it's, it's still downhill from there. And so... Uh, this thing right now that exists in Bitcoin, it's something that we have to fix in the next 85 years or Bitcoin stops working. Now, um, you might be wondering, oh my gosh, all the blocks are going to come out. Why, why aren't people freaking out about this? All the blocks are going to stop coming out. Well, 85 years is a pretty long time. <laughs> and so, you know, everyone kind of feels like we've got enough time to figure this out. And it's a pretty straightforward fix. Uh, we know what it is. We know how to figure it out. Um, deploying it is, is going to be a different challenge. Hopefully, this is one of those things where everyone agrees that it's probably a good idea to fix this. Um, and maybe Bitcoin developers in, you know, 70 or, uh, or 80 years will have to, maybe it'll be a lot easier then. Um, but this is something that's really going to happen. And so, you know, when I see people who are um, holding Bitcoin and, and they see it as sort of, you know, very long term, something that they're going to be able to keep. I think it's important to keep in mind that um, it being successful long term, if you define successful again the way that I did, which is usable, meaning you can make transactions and actually move your Bitcoin if you want to, then um, we do need to make changes. Things need to get changed um, in sometimes in a non backwards compatible way. And this is just one example. Uh, there's more things like this that will surface later and probably some that might surface sooner than 85 years. There's also the inevitability that some of the cryptography primitives that are used in Bitcoin will eventually need to be replaced or made more secure. This is normal. This is what happens to software and to code and to cryptography. It is a living, breathing thing that we constantly need to feed and take care of and maintain and evolve. So uh, still a lot of work to do for Bitcoin is the point that I want to make in this talk and uh, still a lot of opportunity for people to contribute and do this work. Uh, so going back and looking at those open questions that we have, uh, at DCI, here are the ones where we think we can help. 
Um, so here I want to share now some of the things that we're working on at DCI that, uh, that you might find interesting and maybe you might want to help us work on. Um, so the things we're working on right now are really around security and network incentives, the long-term economic security of proof of work. So I'm going to share a little bit about three different projects that we have worked on in the past year or so at DCI. Um, and uh, uh, all of these things are online. There's usually papers uh, off our website. There's code in our GitHub. Um, and uh, you know, feel free to reach out if you would like to learn more. So these three things are a system we built to monitor mining pools, a system we built and some research we did to understand reorgs in proof of work systems, and uh, some work we did that's a little bit more theoretical around incentives in proof of work attacks, double spends. So let's start with the mining pools. So the vast majority of hash rate in Bitcoin and many other coins is in pools. Uh, the reason for this is because miners want to reduce, want to join pools in order to share the risk and reduce their payment variance. So they want to be able to get paid even if they don't happen to stumble upon a block. So mining pools are um, are really, uh, really people really like them. The way that pools work is that the pool operator chooses blocks and assigns work to the miners inside the pool. And what this means is that the miners can't even see really what the transactions are that went into the block, let alone actually validate the block for themselves. They only get a little bit of information. And so miners can't really tell what the pool operator is giving them to mine. Now, the reason that this is concerning is because pools could engage if they wanted to in bad behavior. For example, um, pools could engage in behavior where they mine empty blocks for longer than necessary. This is bad because we're not getting useful work done in the network. We want to get transactions in whenever we can. Pool operators could actually mine on a malicious fork. They could be trying to do a double spend attack and mining on a secret fork that they're going to release later. The miners would might not even realize that this is happening. Um, the pool operators could mine a different coin altogether. Uh, a lot of coins use SHA-256. Uh, and the miners, you know, what it means, there's nothing in the block header that says this is Bitcoin, this is Ethereum or well, Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin SV. Um, and so, uh, you know, miners aren't really checking for that sort of thing. They're just mining. They're just throwing their hash rate at it. Uh, mining pools could also conceal the hash rate they actually have. So, um, you know, uh, right now we look at the blockchain and we, it's usually pretty easy to see which mining pool produce which block because they're pretty public about it. They actually put their information in the block, but mining pools could hide that. Um, they don't necessarily have to do that. And mining pools could uh, do an attack that is uh, um, was developed in 2015 called selfish mining. They could try to withhold blocks and uh, try to release them later uh, in an effort to try to attract more miners and get more rewards. So mining pools, Pretty, pretty, you know, something we know we need to keep an eye on. Um, but what we found at DCI was uh, people weren't really keeping an eye on them. <laughs> and so we built a system called Pool Detective. And um, this was primarily implemented by a uh, then developer at the DCI, Hurt Yap. Um, and what is Pool Detective? Pool Detective is a reverse stratum proxy. So stratum is a protocol used for mining. And what Pool Detective does is it connects to, it connects um, a small number of miners to many, many mining pools. And at the same time, it runs nodes and it monitors blocks that are being uh, transmitted on the peer-to-peer -peer network. And it connects those jobs in the mining pool to blocks it later might see or not see. Um, we are currently monitoring 32 pools on 11 cryptocurrencies. And uh, we found some actually interesting things. <laughs> so one thing we found is that, yeah, sometimes pools are actually giving out uh, jobs on other coins. So here um, we have, in our opinion, um, asked this pool to give us jobs on the coin Bitcoin. Uh, and what we found is that sometimes, sometimes, uh, you know, up to 38% of the time, they're actually giving us jobs on Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin SV. So um, we found this with one pool. Um, you know, not sure what's happened in the past before we started monitoring, but I think it's important to note that if you're mining in this pool, you might be putting your hash power behind Bitcoin SV or Bitcoin Cash and not even know it. You're still getting paid in Bitcoin. And you, you, if you don't actually look at what you're mining, you wouldn't know that. 
Uh, something else we've detected is pools that are mining empty blocks, uh, maybe when they don't need to. So we measured how long it takes for a pool to switch over. So, so basically, after a block is found, um, a pool will mine the next block as an empty block while they validate the previous block because they don't want to let their hash rate just sit idle, but it's not safe to mine any transactions yet because they could have been spent in the previous block. But we want pools to do this for as little time as possible. And uh, hey, look, we can actually measure how long pools are doing this and we can put this information up on the internet. So this is all available at um, if you Google for pool detective if you search for pool detective. And um, we, you know, this was basically built by one person and uh, there isn't a current maintainer at the DCI, but we would love to expand this. We would love to start looking at more things. Like for example, um, we'd love to compare uh, the blocks that miners are uh, making to what we think is in the mempool at, at, at a certain time and what is the best block. Uh, and we think we could use this to detect things like transaction censorship. So really important to do this and to actually surface this. And what really surprised me was that people weren't really doing it. I think we were, we were the first to sort of publicly at least do this. Uh, another project at the DCI is around detecting reorgs. Uh, so what is a reorg? A reorg is when um, chain uh, nodes switch to another blockchain that has a lot of proof of work. And in doing so, they actually switch, um, they go really far back. And reorgs have happened on several smaller proof of work chains. And there have been double spend attacks uh, in Bitcoin gold, I think was the largest. It was about $18 million worth of Bitcoin gold that was, that was spent in a double spend attack. Um, now, there's a lot of things we'd like to know about reorgs that we don't really know right now. Um, how often do they occur? How much do they cost? How often are they attempted versus successful? Um, are the profits of a, of, a, of a reorg from mining rewards or double spend attacks? And this information, again, just wasn't really out there in any sort of a structured way. Um, so James Lovejoy, as part of his master's thesis at the DCI, built something called the reorg detector. Uh, the reason that this isn't just totally straightforward is that you actually have to be careful and be watching during the reorg um, because eventually nodes will discard shorter chains. So you lose that history that a reorg even happened. Uh, the reorg detector uh, was monitoring 23 coins for 10 months. And we combined reorg data with historical prices and hash rate rental market data to try to answer the question of whether or not hash rate rental markets were being used in some of these attacks. And we were the first to report three separate double spend attacks on uh, Vertcoin, Litecoin Cash, and Bitcoin Gold. Um, Last thing I want to talk about that we're working on at DCI is um, the theory and the uh, network incentives of proof of work attacks. Uh, and this is a paper that we did called counterattacking. Now, the idea behind counterattacking is let's say that there's a reorg, a big reorg. The victim miners, those who lost their block rewards, have an interest in getting their block rewards back and probably prefer the original chain. If there's a double spend, the double spent victim also prefers the original chain where they actually got their coins and they might be able to obtain hash power. And uh, together they could actually try to mine on the original chain and make it longer once the attack stops. And the fact that this could happen leads to a good equilibrium where if an attacker knows that this might happen, there's a threat of this happening, then they might never bother to attack in the first place because they just lose. Um, so we describe this work in a paper called Double Spend Counterattacks, Threat of Retaliation in a Proof of Work Systems. Uh, this is uh, the lead author is Daniel Moroz, um, and it's joint work with David Parks at Harvard and Dan Aronoff from the Econ Department. And just to show you quickly what that actually looks like, the green chain, this is three steps of a chain. And so the green chain is the normal chain where the attacker um, does a double spend to a defender. And uh, let's say they spend 90 uh, Bitcoin gold on hash rate to reverse a 100 Bitcoin gold double spend. So the white blocks are the attacker starting to create their, their other chain. But the victim has an interest in getting that 100 BTG back. And so they can continue mining on the original chain. And if they mine on the original chain, all the work that the attacker did is useless. They spent all this money and they don't even have the coins anymore because where they have the coins is not the longest chain. 
And I think what's really cool, this might sound kind of crazy, is that we actually saw this happening in real life. At least we're pretty sure that that's what was happening. Uh, we saw this happen in, on Bitcoin Gold. And we have a blog post uh, that we wrote last year that you can go find and look at all the data we have on some miners on Bitcoin Gold going back and forth um, and extending different chains. So what are the implications of this work that we've been doing? Uh, being open doesn't automatically protect you. You actually have to be watching and alerting. Uh, that, that I think is really important. And I don't understand how anyone could own large amounts of Bitcoin and not be doing this. This is incredibly important. Um, this is a different type of asset than other assets you might be used to uh, holding or thinking about. There's a whole network and protocol and software code base behind this asset. And I think that requires taking certain actions that um, you might not be used to taking with other assets. Another implication is that we're starting to see attackers do more interesting things. Um, I didn't expect to see a counterattack in the wild uh, so soon after we, um, after we wrote our paper about them. Uh, and if we want to rely on things like uh, incentives for the victim to counterattack, then you're going to need certain amounts of credibility. Uh, and, and this means that it doesn't necessarily mean that these things have to happen, but it means that the attacker needs to believe that these things could happen, which means that you probably be, need to be totally ready for them to happen. So you need things like the victims need to have access to hash power. They need to be able to deploy it if they want to, to show the attacker they can counterattack. Miners need to be able to detect large reorgs and rationally choose to ignore them. This is not what the default software does. Um, and so uh, this, is, this is something that, it, you know, I'm not sure if it exists right now. And we might eventually actually need things like the community coordinating around an invalidate block. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is that, yes, it, it, the hash power behind systems like Bitcoin is massive, but you can't take that for granted. And uh, it's not really massive compared to the um, abilities of, of some of global attackers. And so, uh, but all hope is not lost. I think that there are still things that we can investigate and start to look at um, that, can, that can help us uh, keep the system secure. So does any of this sound interesting to you? If it does, we are hiring at DCI. We are hiring in two major areas. One of them is Bitcoin security research and core development. And the other is designing and building digital fiat cash. Um, thinking about things like privacy, strong privacy, offline accessibility and scalability. Um, we're looking for postdocs and software engineers right now. And you can email us at dcijobs at mit.edu. And uh, just real quick, last slide, I want to acknowledge all of these folks who I worked with. Much of this work uh, was done in collaboration. And um, thank you so much to all of the people. I feel so lucky that I get to work with these amazing people in Bitcoin and at the DCI every day. And thank you to all of the funders um, and supporters of the DCI who helped make it possible to do this work. Great. Thank you, Neha, for that eye-opening discussion about Bitcoin's uh, future, uh, future security implications, some of which I wish I had thought of myself.